Hello, everyone, and welcome to this session, Turbocharge Your Application Workloads with Amazon Elasticash. My name is Damon LaKyle. I'm a Solutions Architect Specialist here at AWS. I'm going to be walking you through how you can turbocharge your database application workloads, specifically with Amazon Elasticash. All right, what are we going to talk about today in today's session? So first, we'll talk about the need for speed and why it's so important to have a high-performance environment for the application environment that your customers are using. And we'll map that to the bottom line of the business. We'll talk about specific ways on actually improving database performance, but then also how to implement an elastic cache, distributed cache to boost that performance even further. I'll walk you through cluster creation, how to connect to the cluster. We'll run a benchmark, and then we're gonna run a demo to show you the type of performance you can achieve with just a simple application. And we'll talk about cost optimization, which is one of our pillars of well-architected framework, which essentially means you want to not only make it as fast as possible, but you wanna make it as fast as possible at the lowest cost possible. And then we'll close out with some resources to get you started. Okay, we'll start with the need for speed. And this really sets the stage for why it's so important to have a fast environment for our customers these days. So why does performance matter? Well, there was a study done and it said the number one reason people abandon a website after just one page is that it's slow to load and it could just be two or three seconds. It was shown that 90% of the people are going to leave. Over half the people are gonna take their business and take it to a competitor. And about one out of every four or about 25% are not going to return to the website. And that's pretty important. We know how hard it is to attract and retain customers. And so when we lose customers, it's of course hard to gain that trust back. There's another study said that one tenth of a second delay can hurt conversion rates. And just a two second delay can increase bounce rate by over 100%. So this tells us that customers aren't wanting to wait anymore. They don't want to wait just a few seconds. They want immediate response. No longer will they wait for the service. They'll take their business elsewhere. And so we can see there's a map, there's a direct link, a correlation to having a slow service, a slow database, a slow, P a slow API or a website, and a direct link to say, our customers are going to leave to a competitor. So it's very, very important here to realize we're no longer in that era where customers are willing to wait even for a few seconds. And that's why there's this need for speed. So. What does ElastiCache have to do with Need for Speed? Well, ElastiCache is an in-memory data store and cache. And it's critical to understand that the in-memory aspect of it is key here. One of the reasons that in-memory is important is because it's incredibly fast. Data that is in-memory is at least 20 times faster in throughput than even solid state disks. So that means the data coming from memory is going to flow much faster from memory than it would flow from a disk. Additionally, in-memory data stores are predictable, meaning we're not seeking on the disk because there is no disk. It's all a key-based index, meaning if you have the key name, that is a direct memory pointer to where the data is, where it resides in memory. So there's absolutely no lookup time as well. So we have customers that demand millisecond and sub-millisecond performance because their service that they offer their customer loses value if even there's a one millisecond, a two millisecond delay. So if they need to have sub millisecond performance, they need to manage it at the microsecond level. And that's one of the reasons we have this saying that microseconds is the new milliseconds with Amazon ElastiCache. And I hope to prove that to you throughout the rest of this session. Let's set the stage about how databases perform and how they scale. And that'll kind of give you an idea and context of the distributed cache mechanism, how that scales and why it peru uh, uh, improves performance. So if you take a standard relational database access pattern, you know, you have your EC2 systems or your Lambda clients, whatever it might be, your compute systems, and they need data. So they don't have data in memory. So they go out and they either write the data to the database or they read it from the database. And this is kind of a standard approach and it's been this way for forever, right? Ever since databases have been around, you basically get the data from the database because you don't have it in memory and you write to the database when you want to persist or durably store that data. 
Now with the relational databases, we have this concept of a primary server. Now that primary server can scale vertically. And why would you want to do that? Well, essentially when you have more data that it can hold, you either need to scale up in either memory or CPU or network bandwidth. Any of these allows the database to scale vertically. So if you run out of memory, if you need more CPU compute power or more network bandwidth, you have the option to scale vertically. Now, relational databases have traditionally scaled this way for decades, and it's really one of the limited ways that they can do it. They can't scale horizontally, at least with the primary database or the primary server. So that's how primary databases or relational databases can scale vertically. They can also scale horizontally in the sense that you can add read replicas. So that primary database replicates its data, and that way you can read from these replicas, and that allows increased read capacity. That means you can make your writes to the primary and you can send your reads to the replicas. And this essentially offloads a lot of the read heavy workload from that primary node so that it can perform writes better and it can focus a little bit more on whatever the primary use case is beyond the read heavy workloads. Now, you can continue to scale this way uh, up to a point. There are some drawbacks. Essentially, vertical scaling with that primary node is limited. So let's say you're at 32 gigabytes of memory and you need to scale. Well, the next one is 64 gigabytes and then maybe 128 gigabytes. And it doubles every time, but essentially at some point you're going to hit a limit that a single server can provide, both from memory and CPU and even network capacity as well. The scaling horizontally with replicas is good for heavy read and um, you know, increased read capacity, read heavy workloads. Um, but you are duplicating or replicating 100% of your data when you might not need to be doing that. And we'll talk a little bit more about what hot data or cache data looks like. And when you do read from these replicas, you're still impacted by reading directly from the disk. So even though you have cache on both the primary and replicas, there's a certain amount of memory reserved for storing memory and cache. It is limited on a per server basis. So once that is, is exhausted, you have to read from the disk. And that's the majority of the time your reads are going to be coming from disk and writes too. So you will incur that disk-based latency. So how can we get around this? We can add what's called a distributed cache. That essentially means something like Amazon Elastic Cache. It improves latency. As we talked about earlier, it's all in memory. And it is sub-millisecond lookup time. Increased read capacity. You can vertically and horizontally scale Amazon Elastic Cache, and I'll show you how to do that. And it's a very predictable cost at scale, meaning it scales linearly and it scales incrementally as well. It scales both vertically and horizontally while your application is online. And it's really only a fraction of the database size, even from the replica standpoint. So if you have 100 terabytes of data, you don't need to replicate 100 terabytes of data into the cache. It depends on what your cache hit rate is, and we'll talk about that a little bit more as well. So let's talk briefly about what Amazon Last Cache is before we get into some of the demos. So AWS has this concept of a purpose-built database. So essentially that comes down to using the right tool for the job. Amazon Elastic Cache is our in-memory and cache data store where it's really focused on kind of ephemeral data use cases, such as caching. There are a lot of other use cases we use it for, but this specific session will talk about caching. Amazon Elastic Cache is a fully managed service, meaning we provision the hardware, we configure the caching engine, whether it's Redis or Memcached. We configure it to best practices, uh, we secure it, we monitor it, we provide failover, we provide snapshot backups and restore, so on and so forth. So you can focus on what you do best, which is providing solutions for your customers. It's open source compatible with both the Redis and Memcached engines, which means if you have an existing application that runs on either of those, you can typically migrate that with little or even no code changes. Amazon Elastic Cache is incredibly scalable. In fact, just a single cluster can have up to 500 nodes and with the largest node type, that gets you about 340 terabytes of in-memory data storage. And we'll talk a little bit later how you can even get more with data tiering. And then finally, Elastic Cache is known for being extremely performant. And if you think about having that in-memory data store that we talked about earlier, uh, 
where you have sub millisecond access time or even microsecond access time. And you combine that with the scalability and the linear scalability specifically with the last catch for Redis up to 500 nodes, you can just imagine the type of performance you can achieve. And speaking of performance, um, we do provide both Intel and Graviton 2 based instances. And I'll give you a little slide here, a little table that shows some of the benchmarks we did when we first came out with Graviton 2 instance types. So what you see here is a comparison of our Intel or M5 node, uh, Elasticache node, uh, compared to our M6G or Graviton 2 instance node. Now, this was a very specific test that we did, and you can see the link here and, and look at the configuration of the uh, test framework itself. But what we found was that you can get up to 57% performance gain by using the Graviton 2 instance types. And in fact, Graviton 2 is now the default instance type when you go to create an Elasticache cluster. You can still select the Intel or M5 or R5 uh, or a number of other different types of uh, instance types that we have available. But by default, we believe that the Graviton 2 is the best price performance ratio for our customers, which is why we have it as the default in the, in the UI. So let's talk a little bit about performance itself. I'm gonna step you through a demo of what caching looks like, and then we'll step through cluster creation, uh, connecting to the cluster, and doing another open source benchmark as well. Okay, so now what we're going to do is we're going to transition to showing a demo of the type of performance you can get by implementing Amazon Elasticache. All right, what we have here is an application that will read from a database and it will store the results of queries into Amazon Elasticache. Once it does that, it will query Amazon Elasticache from that point forward so that we can have much faster response times. So what we have are a few sliders here. Right now, we're going to keep our time to live at about 30 seconds or 3,000 milliseconds or about 30,000 milliseconds, excuse me. Uh, we're gonna set the number of different queries to about 200 uh, for this demo because we want a cache hit ratio of about 90%. In a production environment, you really wanna have a high cache hit ratio so you can get maximum performance and maximum cost effectiveness of your cluster. So we do that by doing about 200 different queries and about 2000 total calls. So that gets us about 90% about hit, hit rate. We're gonna set our query complexity to high and I'll show you what those queries look like. We're gonna be running this against the PostgreSQL database. And we have the same instance type on both the PostgreSQL as well as the uh, Elasticache system. So we're not giving one system a leg up over the other. So what I'm gonna do is click QueryDB. It's gonna run this. You're gonna see the sliders and the charts start to update. And you can see the progress is about 14%. I'm gonna slide down while that's running. And I wanna show you some of these uh, queries that are actually being executed. So you can see on the right, you can see hits and misses, and they're all about hits right now because we've warmed up the cache already. But what you can see is we're doing substrings, we're doing an inner join, we're doing a group by. So it's not just a simple select, we're doing a few extra clauses inside of here to make it a little bit more complex. And the more complex the query is, the more benefit you're going to get from having that pre-computed result set stored in cache. So let's slide back up and look at some of these results. Zoom out a little bit. I'm gonna start here with some of these bars. So as we expected, we have about a 90% cache hit rate, which means, again, we had 200 unique queries, but we ran 2000 total queries. So the first time the query is run, the data is not going to be in the cache. So then the application will query the database instead and then store that result in the cache. So the following nine or 10 queries for that specific execution query are gonna be in the cache. The first thing I wanna point out is we got about over, let's see, 3,400 requests per second from Elasticache, and we got about 45 queries per second from the database. And if I just run a quick calculator on this, um, that's about 75 times faster uh, so we ran about 75 times as many commands per second in Elasticache uh, or queries and result sets retrieved than from the source database. Now let's look at what the request latency looks like over on the left. As you can see, the tall orange bar are cache misses or what we would consider a query to the database. 
So when there's a cache miss, the application has to go to the database and fetch the actual source result set. And then it stores it in Elastic Cache so that subsequent queries are much faster. You can see here that it was about 22,000 microseconds or about 22 milliseconds on average for the database to query. But in Amazon Elastic Cache, that same result set was retrieved in about 283 microseconds. And that's going to be equivalent to about the same 75 times performance improvement. And you can see on the right, about 90% of the uh, queries were cache hits. And that's really what we want to get uh, as close to 100% as possible. Of course, you don't want all of your data to be 100% in cache because you do want to make sure that you're not running into cache and validation issues. So you want to make sure your time to live on these expires such that it's appropriate to the workload or the freshness factor that you want for your data. So this gives you an idea of just a simple demo, and I'm going to walk you through a little bit of the code here in just a second of how you can implement this. That's, this literally takes about 10 lines of code to implement caching. Now, the demo itself is much more complex, of course. You know, There's a UI aspect of it. There's things running in the background. But the actual database access pattern where you query from the database and then you query from the cache if it's not there is very simple. So hopefully this gives you an idea of just the dramatic impact that the performance you can, you can get by having Amazon Elastic Cache in here as well. So I'm going to slide over to a bit of the code so we can see what that database access pattern looks like. So what you see here is what we call the fetch function. And I've commented out all the lines that have to do with the demo. And I've left the lines highlighted in color that you can see here that are part of the access pattern. So really what we're doing is every time we have a SQL command, we're passing it to this fetch function. What we're doing is we're creating a hash based off of the SQL that we're passing in. So regardless of how complex or long or lengthy the SQL query is, we run this hash against it, and it results in a 32-byte unique string that we can store as the key name, which is really cool because you don't want the key name to be a really long SQL string. It can be very, very big. And in fact, key names do take up memory inside of Elasticash, so you want to be careful of how much space the key names themselves take in addition to the key value. So the hash is actually the SQL uh, converted to a 32-byte string. The next thing we do is we ask Redis to get that key. So we're saying Redis, have you seen the results of this query before? And if Redis has, meaning the value is not none, meaning it, Redis has seen it, it's going to return that value really quickly, sub-millisecond access time. And then if it doesn't, what we do is we simply go to the database, we get the cursor, we execute the original SQL that we passed into this function, we fetch all of the results. And then once we do that, we take those results and we store it in Redis in this line. So I, again, this is there's a lot of other code in here that I've commented out, things that increase counters, track timing, et cetera, for the demo. But if all I needed to do was implement the access pattern, all of these highlighted commands or all these highlighted lines of code are essentially what you'd have to implement to have what we call this lazy loading approach. It's a very simple approach. And again, this is about 10 lines of code uh, that you could implement with a POC and get these types of benefits uh, that you're seeing in this demo as well. OK, so now that we've seen the performance demo, let's go through creating a cluster. And we'll also show you how to connect to the cluster as well. All right, so we are in the AWS console, and specifically in the Elasticash console. You can see I've already got two clusters here, uh, the one for the demo I just showed, and then one for a benchmark I'll show you in a few minutes. Let's click Create Redis Cluster. And I'll step you through some of this. Um, it's not very, uh, it's very self-explanatory. Uh, but if you do have questions, there are there are help icons in here, you know, little hover uh, text icons. There's also uh, the documentation. It's very thorough. Everything I'm doing in the UI can also be done through the API and AWS CLI as well. So we're going to start by creating a new cluster. You also have the option to create a new cluster by restoring from a snapshot backup from a previous cluster, if you like. We're going to go with cluster mode enabled. What this allows us to do is scale our cluster out to 500 nodes, if that's really what we want. And we're going to use a concept called shards, which I'll explain a little bit later as well. So we can give it just a regular cluster name, my test cluster. 
you have the option of deploying on the cloud, of course, but if you're running AWS Outposts, you can, of course, also provision there, which would mean you'd have it locally on premises. We're gonna go with multi-availability zone. So that's how we achieve high availability. And it allows us to have automatic failover that you can see here is checked as well. That means whether it's a node that has a failure event or in the unlikely event that an availability zone becomes unavailable, we'll still have nodes spread throughout the region and we can fail over to any of them. We're gonna go with the latest version of the Redis engine, which is 6.2, the standard port of 6.379. Now parameter groups have, you know, dozens or even hundreds of parameters that you can set specifically on these Alaska Cache for Redis clusters. We're gonna leave this as the default, but you can change things in there uh, all sorts of things. You can do things like change the max memory policy, which tells it when to evict keys. You can tell, you can modify information about client buffers, et cetera. So by default, like I mentioned earlier, uh, a Graviton2 instance type is the default. We're gonna leave that uh, as cache.r6g.large. We're gonna start with three shards. Essentially, that's a best practice for uh, so that you can achieve not only better performance, but also faster failover as well. It's also a best practice to have two replicas per shard. If you need to, you can uh, have one replica per shard and still have high availability, but we do recommend two for a number of reasons that uh, the documentation can explain a little bit better. Now I'm gonna choose an existing subnet group just for the purpose of the demo, but you can create a new subnet group if you like. I'm just gonna choose the standard one that I've got set up on the default, which includes all of the availability zones in US East. And then down here, uh, availability zone placement, we want equal distribution. If we wanted to, we could specify which availability zone had which nodes, and we don't have a preference of where they're going. I'm gonna click next. Typo that, had a space in the name, which I shouldn't have. Click next. Now we have the option to enable encryption at rest, which means any data that is stored on disk during a backup or replication. And when data is snapshot backup over to S3, it will be encrypted. So we'll turn that on. You have the option to use our default key or your own customer provided uh, key as well. We can enable encryption in transit, which essentially means the data will be encrypted not only from the client to the servers, but also between the servers as well. We can set a standard password, or we can specifically set a user group access control list, which allows specific users to have access to specific keys and to run specific commands as well. For the purpose of the demo, I'm just gonna give it a single password All right, and then security groups. You wanna have a security group that allows access to port 6379 or the Redis port uh, based on you know, where you're coming from. So in this one, I'm going to choose Elastic Cache for Redis, which allows port 6379. And then I'm going to allow automatic backups, which will enable a daily backup or a snapshot backup. We don't mind when it happens in this sense. For the demo purposes, I'm not specifying a maintenance window. Uh, the only other thing I really wanted to touch on here are the logs. A nice thing about uh, Amazon Last Cache for Redis specifically is that if commands take longer than uh, 10 milliseconds to run by default, you can actually record information about what the command was, uh, which client launched it, what time, how long it took, things like that. We're gonna enable that and we're gonna leave it in JSON format. We're gonna send that to CloudWatch Logs and then I'm going to choose an existing group that I already have set up, monitoring cloud logs. And the same thing for Redis engine logs as well. We can do the same thing. So we're gonna send those to CloudWatch logs as well. And I'm gonna set that to my monitoring cluster logs group. And then finally, if I wanted to add tags so that I could search or filter, I could do that as well. Click next. And then this is a summary screen of the information that we've selected during uh, this provisioning event here. So uh, I would normally click create and show you, but it takes about 15 minutes or so to create this cluster, give or take, depending on the region and how many nodes and shards that you have. So I'm actually not gonna click create. I could, I'm just gonna click cancel because I already have two different uh, systems set up here for the purpose of demonstration. 
this this bottom one we just we just touched on was actually during that performance demo. It was a very small system uh, with just two nodes, a primary and a replica for R6G.large, meaning it was you know one of the smaller, more modest node types, but you still saw the performance improvement you can achieve with that. Now, what we have here is this other uh, cluster here on the top where we have three shards. I'm going to click on that. And you can see what we have here is a total of three shards, uh, but six total nodes. What that means is if I scroll down and I expand, you can see the different shards here with the little disclosure minus sign. And each one has a, both a primary and a replica. So what we can do here is we have what's called a configuration endpoint. I can copy that. And that's going to be the actual access point we use from our command line to connect to this cluster. And that's what we're going to do next. So I'm going to slide over to my terminal window. And from the terminal window, what we want to do, this is an EC2 system. We want to install the Redis open source utilities. And to do that, it's just a simple couple of commands. So there's the sudo Amazon Linux extras, enable Redis 6, and then sudo yum y install Redis. Now this is running on Amazon Linux too, uh, and this actually happens to be a Graviton2 uh, EC2 instance as well. So this is both for Intel and Graviton2, you can run these two commands and it will install the uh, open source Redis utilities, which includes the Redis CLI and the Redis benchmark utility. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna type Redis CLI, I'm gonna do dash H for host, I'm gonna paste what I just typed in or what we just copied Copy this again, paste it into here. I'm gonna remove the 6379 because that's not a standard URL. And then the only other thing I'm gonna do is add a dash C, which means cluster mode. And this is going to allow the Redis CLI to switch between the different shards when it needs to based off of the name of the key. So I click return and now we're connected. So if I typed keys and hit uh, asterisk and hit return, you can see that there's already a key on this shard. So if I wanted to set a value, I could do something as simple as set the key name of A to value one. And you can see that it redirected us to a different shard and then it says, okay. Now that's what the dash C stood for was dash or for cluster, which allowed the client to intelligently switch between shards depending on where that key was going to reside. So if I wanted to type get A and get the value of A, it says one. So that's as simple as it gets, right? We just connected to the Redis cluster in cluster mode. We set a key, we retrieved the key, and we saw that the CLI was able to migrate between the different shards depending on what it is that we were trying to do. So that's super simple to connect to from the command line. Now let's run a benchmark against this. One of the things that's installed when you install those Redis CLI or those Redis utilities is something called Redis benchmark. Let me clear the screen. I've actually created an alias called Benchmark, and I'll show you what that does. It runs the Redis Benchmark utility. It passes dash H along with the Redis endpoint, which is the one we already have. We're running a total of 100,000 commands. We're running 10 total clients. Now this is a little bit different. This dash C actually means clients, um, not cluster. And then the dash T tells it which commands to run for the Redis Benchmark. And then finally, the dash dash cluster is the equivalent of that dash C we saw in the Redis CLI. And then finally, at the end, we have dash Q, which means quiet mode. And that essentially means that we're not going to see a lot of detailed updates while it's running, um, but we will get the summary. And then finally, we're redirecting standard error out to dev null. There are some warning messages. I just don't want it to be uh, distract, uh, dist distractive, uh, disruptive uh, or distract you from what the actual benchmark does here. So I'm gonna type benchmark and let it run. You can see that it has three primary nodes or three shards that it's talking to. And it's running the set commands and now it's running the get commands. All right, so what we can see is that after about 100,000 commands were run, the sets were able to achieve about six, oh, almost 17,000 requests per second with an average or P50 of under half of a millisecond. Same thing with get, we're getting between 16 and 17,000 requests per second. Uh, again, sub millisecond, even uh, 479 microseconds on average. So consider the fact that this EC2 instance is inside of an availability zone. 
And those three shards are in availability zones as well. It could be the same availability zone, um, but we know that the client is in one availability zone and the shards are in up to three others. So even if one of the shards is in the same AZ, two of them are not, which means we're still averaging 470 microseconds for these requests across availability zones, which is very impressive. So hopefully this gives you an idea of how easy it is to install the Redis uh, utilities, connect to an Elasticash for Redis cluster, run some basic commands, and then also see what benchmark does. And you can benchmark this. And the last thing I want to mention is that uh, keep in mind, we're running this benchmark with a single uh, client on EC2. We're running 10 clients on this you know, single EC2 system. Um, but the benchmarks we showed earlier with that table of you know, 300,000 requests per second, et cetera, that's where we had multiple EC2 systems, you know, 800 total clients accessing the system. So again, the Elasticash for Redis cluster can actually support much more than what we're seeing here, but I'm limited by the amount of throughput I can do with a single EC2 system. All right, let's jump back to the presentation and we'll continue to talk about cost optimization. Okay, so as I mentioned earlier, an important thing about not just getting your cluster or environment to be as fast as possible, you wanna make sure that you balance that with cost. So if you spend all your time focusing just on increasing database performance specifically, that can be costly both in terms of resources, but also time as well. Now you have to balance that with the actual cost of the solution itself, both short-term investment and long-term cost. So we wanna to strive to improve performance at the lowest possible cost. So not only do distributed caches provide a lot of this just by their very nature, but also Amazon Elasticash has some additional features that can help us manage those costs as well. So let's walk through what a, maybe a, I would say relatively simple cost saving scenario would be. Let's say, and I run this through the AWS calculator we have online on our public website. As you see here in the middle, what I've highlighted in yellow is an Amazon RDS for Oracle instance. It has four vCPUs and 32 gigabytes of memory. And with the Oracle license, that costs about $1,300 a month based off of the hourly cost. Now, if we wanted to scale that Oracle instance, let's say we've either run out of memory or we've run out of network capacity, and we want to scale that, we have two options. If it's a read heavy workload, we could simply add another instance and make it a replica. <clears throat> and what we could do is then send our reads to those replicas and maybe offload it. Um, but that would still cost essentially the same amount, right? We'd still have to add another RDS for Oracle instance at the same cost. The other option is to scale vertically. So we could take that system that has four vCPUs and we could scale it vertically and that would double everything. So eight vCPUs and 64 gigabytes. So either way you wanted to scale, it's gonna cost about $1,300 a month additional or a 100% increase. Now, if what we're running into is either network capacity and we're you know, running out of network throughput or we're simply running out of, net, of memory for cache, a much better approach might be to implement Amazon Elasticash. If we were to deploy just a single node of Amazon Elasticash, we could at least double our throughput. And we saw during that performance demo quite possibly much more than that for only a 23% increase in cost or about $300 a month. So you can see this is significant savings. In this example, it's about $12,000 per year. And of course, all of these systems can scale you know, in different ways. And this is relatively simplistic, but it does capture the essence and the fundamentals of how you would want to maybe spend your time and money and investment on what makes the most sense dollar for dollar for performance. What are some of the financial advantages of caching? Not just the amount of money you're spending, you know, just avoiding scaling vertically with your database. So with Elasticash, you can scale um, with a per instance fee. What that means is since this is an EC2 based or a node based service, you're only being charged for the node that you're using for the service itself. There are no separate read or write IO charges. There are some services where you have to pay either for reads or writes or pre-provisioned, et cetera. That's not the case with Amazon Elasticash. You can implement caching with virtually any relational database or NoSQL database. In fact, 
you can implement caching with essentially anything that can be queried, which should even be APIs or uh, different services across the network. And typically, this is a far less expensive solution than scaling your database vertically, as we just saw in the last table. So let's talk about how we can actually scale ElastiCache, and then that'll give you some context as to how we can implement some of the other features like auto scaling to save costs as well. So we take a standard kind of this approach where we have a bunch of clients reading and writing to the network. Um, the data is typically written to what we call the primary server inside of ElastiCache. And that data is then asynchronously replicated to one or more replicas. Now in this instance, what we can do is we can read from the replicas and we can write to the primary, very similar to what we saw earlier, even in that relational database model where you write to a primary and then read from replicas. Now you can have up to five replicas per shard inside of Amazon ElastiCache. And this is great if you need, if you have a read heavy workload, you can scale just by adding replicas. Now this unit of a primary and multiple replicas is what we call a shard. In this instance, we have a single shard. So all of our data is residing in that single shard. So regardless of the key that you're modifying, you're always going to talk to that primary when you need to mutate that data. And if you need to read it, you can read from any of those servers in that shard. Now, if we need to scale, we can scale horizontally by simply taking that shard concept and adding more shards. Now, ElastiCache will take the keys in the existing shards and in a live fashion, migrate those keys uh, across the new shards so that it balances it. And this is an online non-disruptive action. So your application stays online, your client is redirected to the appropriate shard depending on the key name, and there's no disruption to your client. Now this allows horizontal scaling, meaning you can add another shard to this. So if we have three shards and we wanted to add it a fourth, that would essentially just increase our costs just a little bit, right? Rather than doubling everything. So we can scale incrementally both performance wise, as well as from a budget perspective as well. So we can add scale, we can add uh, more shards to scale our writes and we can add replicas to scale reads. ElastCache also provides vertical scaling, meaning let's say we have a two shard cluster. Uh, let's say it's an R5 for R6G.XL and we wanted to go to an R6G.2XL. Well, our existing cluster, while it's running, Amazon ElastCache is going to spin up a new cluster that is the same number of shards, same configuration and everything, same users, same access, et cetera, but it's going to be on that increased node size. Once that's provisioned and ready, ElastiCache will start to synchronize the data. And once the data is fully synchronized, that's when we'll switch over between the previous cluster and the new cluster, and the new cluster is now live, and there's no code changes needed to your application. It's still the same endpoint. There will be a slight disruption of a few seconds while your clients disconnect and reconnect. But again, this is from the, from the server perspective, this is instantaneous. And from the client application perspective, it just automatically reconnects to the new cluster. Now, we talked about scaling and you can scale at any time that you want, whether it's replicas or adding shards. Now, what happens if you don't want to manage that yourself, but you still want the benefits of avoiding over-provisioning? Well, we can use something called auto-scaling inside of Amazon ElastiCache. So it's very similar to uh, Amazon EC2 auto-scaling groups, where you have automatic scaling based off of the instance and different policies. So now, not only from the application perspective, uh, from the database perspective, but also now from the caching perspective, you can have auto-scaling features as well. And this automatically will size your ElastiCache cluster to meet your workload needs. You don't have to pay for unused capacity. There's automatic algorithms built in to where if you're not using it or certain metrics uh, do not sustain at a specific uh, point or threshold, it will start to scale back in automatically for you. You can either add shards or replicas depending on the policy that you set up. And you can use metrics to horizontally scale in and out, meaning whether it's uh, memory capacity is reaching maximum capacity or your CPUs are reaching maximum capacity. We have a few different options of scaling. We also have the ability to schedule scaling activities. So if you have, let's say, um, a matchmaking site or whether it's something that's more active on the weekends, you can scale out, let's say, on Friday mornings and then scale back in on Monday mornings if that's what your access pattern looks like. 
We also have something called Amazon Elastic Cash Global Data Store. And this is fantastic, not only for performance, but also for cost savings if you have a globally distributed application and customer, uh, customer base. So let's take, we have, for an example, a primary or active region where we have our last cash cluster and we're doing reads and writes from our clients there. What we have the ability to do now is using our cross region link, we can replicate that data to a secondary or a passive region to another elastic cash cluster. And that way those clients in those other regions can have low latency, low latency reads, so sub millisecond reads, and they don't have to go across that, um, that region link for just the queries that have already been accessed. So as an example, let's say in the first VPC or in the first region, a query was run and that the result set is replicated to the second region now, if one of those clients there needs to run that same query, they don't need to go across that cross-region link to query the original database. They're just querying ElastCache locally and they're getting sub-millisecond response times. So this is an active passive type of setup. So what this allows is we're really only replicating the hot or cache data, which if you think about it, that's very efficient rather than replicating an entire database, right? This means it's a much smaller and faster replication uh, and typically less costly as well that way. And we don't duplicate the entire database. We only duplicate again that hot cache data. So it makes it much more efficient and cost effective as well. Not only does this provide better performance for uh, geo-distributed applications, it also provides a fantastic solution for DR or disaster recovery for your in-memory uh, ephemeral use cases as well. Now, speaking of uh, savings, uh, we also have something called data tiering. Now, this is a, a fairly new feature we provided. What this allows, uh, I'll give you an example, is if we take a standard r6g.xlarge instance and we compare it to an r6gd.xlarge instance, and that's the data tiering function. What this allows us to do is to take data once memory is filled up and, it, and send it to a locally attached high-speed NVMe solid state drive. So let's do a quick comparison here. If you compare the two, of course, they're going to have the same number of vCPUs. They're going to have the same amount of physical memory. And the difference here is that that locally attached NVMe SSD is going to give you about 100 gigabytes extra for this specific instance type. What that allows you to have is almost five times the capacity uh, for this uh, Last Cache for Redis engine. Um, but you can see the cost is nowhere near five times based on capacity you can actually save over 60% if you're utilizing memory uh, to its fullest in this example. So let's talk about how it actually works. So in this instance, what happens is hot data is always stored in memory. Warm data is stored on that locally attached NVMe. So there is a least recently used policy and there's actually a few policies. One is your standard Redis policy where it will evict keys uh, when storage is full or when memory is full. However, when memory is full now, data is actually pushed to this NVMe disk up to the point where that NVMe disk is full. Now, this is a non-blocking mechanism, both in storing the data to the disk and retrieving it. It's about a 300 microsecond uh, cost in terms of latency to uh, retrieve data from that solid state drive. So 300 microseconds, and we already saw earlier in the performance demo, where we were typically getting about three to 400, maybe 450 microseconds on average. So, you know, you're still getting sub millisecond access, even accessing data on that SSD. So this is ideal for workloads that usually have about 20% of their data or hot data and needs to be in memory. You could have more than that. You know, you can, uh, if you have more than 20%, that's fine. It's just that there's going to be more data going back and forth between that channel. Um, but it's most effective when there's about 20% of the data is, is in hot, is in memory. No application changes are required. Again, minimal performance impact, a few hundred microseconds. Again, that's non-blocking. So if you need to fetch data from the SSD, no other channels, no other clients are going to be blocked while that happens. And with data tiering, what you can achieve is over or up to one petabyte in size for this Amazon Alaskash for Redis. Uh, data store. So that's fantastic in terms of total data set size. And if you need high speed data, uh, sub millisecond access. All right. So 
Let's talk about a few key takeaways from today's session, and then we'll close out with some resources that you can access as well. So with Amazon Elasticash, you can reduce unnecessary instance costs, meaning that if you have databases you need to vertically scale, you can actually implement Amazon Elasticash for much less cost. Because data is in memory, there's a dramatic decrease in latency, like you saw with that demo. There's a significant increase in throughput simply because data can move faster from memory to the network than it can from the disk to the network. It's a very developer friendly, meaning it uses both Redis and Memcached data types, simple API, and there's fully documented access uh, on the web. Easily scales to massive workloads, meaning you can have not only 500 nodes per cluster, you can have multiple clusters in the same region. We have global data store, which increases it as well. It's fully managed, like we said, we take care of everything for you so that you can focus on what's most important for your customers. It's highly available, meaning it has failover, high availability, and it's secure with encryption in transit and encryption at rest. And it's extremely cost effective. You only pay for what you use. There's no per transaction costs, and there's no read or write transaction costs as well. So how do you get started? Well, there's a few developer resources that I'm gonna suggest. One is a session similar to this one, not unlike, but we actually go through in a little more detail how to actually set up some of the code. So I uh, encourage you to, uh, to watch that. We also have what's called the Amazon Elasticash Learning Path, which is just over two hours of videos that steps you through what Amazon Elasticash is, the use cases, the data types, and as you can see in this screenshot here, the different commands available and when you would want to use them. So if you'd like to scan that QR code, it'll take you directly to there. How can you engage with our Elasticash team? Well, we have something called an immersion day, which is typically anywhere between half a day to a full day where we provide a complete Amazon environment for you, uh, along with labs and resources that you can step through and it's instructor led. We can do what's called a well-architected review, meaning if you have an existing Amazon Elasticash cluster, we can step you through some of our well-architected framework pillars, just like we talked about today, cost optimization being one, performance efficiency being others, and we have six total. We can spend some time with you doing a design review or architecture. So uh, if you've not yet implemented Amazon Elasticash, we can help you talk about data types, cluster modeling, et cetera. And then finally, we have something called pilot acceleration, which is kind of a cadence call that we have every few weeks or every week or two, where we step through how you're doing on your actual application, along with some labs that we can help as well. So these are all free for our customers, no obligation. If you have questions and you want to engage with us directly, you can either go to our link here at amazon.com slash Elasticash, or you can email us directly at elasticash gtm support at amazon.com. So with that, I'll open it up for questions, and I'd like to say thank you very much for attending and open it up now. Thank you very much.